Thank you very much. It's uh, a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk here and be back here. I, well, as you'll see when I go through some of this, I spent most of the year in 2011-12 here working with Sebastian and his group, which was wonderful. And I have a chance to come back, so I did. <laughs> so bending and breaking helium crystals, and I'd just like to point out that in Alberta, uh, the two people that probably some of the work you'll see here just as background are Zhigang Cheng, a postdoc who recently got a job, permanent job in China, and James Day, who was a graduate student at that time. But an awful lot of it, as you'll see, is together with the, the group of Sebastian. Uh, and the people in particular were postdoc Andrew Pfefferman and, and student Ariel Azio and Xavier Ro Rojas and Fabian Suri. So many of you would know some of these people probably still. Uh, many of them have spent time at Alberta. So this is just a picture of going walking in the mountains of when Sebastian visited us once. This is an ice uh, climb where people who are adventurous go ice climbing. Uh, Sebastian didn't, but he probably would have been safer to do it. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to talk about is helium as a quantum crystal. So I just want to point out what, what I mean by a quantum crystal. In a conventional crystal, you go to zero temperature, atoms sit at lattice sites, they don't move, nothing happens. Uh, in a helium crystal, the problem is if you try to localize a helium atom within a, a lattice site, you're kind of pushing on the uncertainty principle because localizing it forces it to have zero point kinetic energy. And so you can measure how quantum a solid is by the ratio between this zero point kinetic energy that just is the ground state energy if you put it in a box the size of the lattice, and the potential energy, which is that they do interact kind of weakly with each other through a interatomic potential. And so the ratio of those gives you a measure of whether it's very quantum mechanical. And something like argon that you might think is a bit, it's weak and it's kind of light, it's, it's a small correction, this parameter. Helium, it dominates. It's not a small correction, it's, it's almost all of it. The kinetic energy of zero point motion swamps everything else. So it's highly, highly quantum mechanical. And sort of separate but related is the fact that I, atoms themselves, not electrons, but atoms can exchange positions quantum mechanically. They're identical particles. And that's not a trivial thing. This exchange frequency in a crystal of helium is, uh, can be up to megahertz frequencies. It's a serious contri contribution. So they're highly, highly quantum mechanical solid compared to anything else. Uh, and so the question in a quantum solid like this that I'm going to address is mechanical properties. And so if you talk about the elasticity of the shear modules, is a helium crystal very rigid? It's not very rigid, but is it rigid at all? Uh, if you try to really deform it, how soft and squishy is it? Is it brittle? Or does it flow all the time? Um, and even, as, as mentioned, uh, about 2004, people seriously put forward experiments using a torsional oscillator to say it's a super solid, which means you can have so much exchange or something that these atoms aren't even localized. Their, their lattice sites are well defined, but you might only have, for example, 99% of an atom at every lattice site. So you'd have a completely delocalized group of vacancies, even at zero temperature, as a proposal, in which case it would both have crystalline order and be a superfluid. Turns out that's not quite what, what happens, but <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about shear modulus measurements, plasticity measurements that we more recently did, and the very most recent thing, if I have time at the end, is a bit about flow in such a solid. And so I'll give you a quick background in the rise and fall of super solid, um, and then something about background about how the elastic properties of anything, but in particular helium crystals, uh, depend on defects, and then use that to talk about the elasticity but also then the plastic deformation, perhaps how, whether there is any flow. Okay, <clears throat> so just to remind anybody that hasn't seen this, the classic way to really say you've got a superfluid liquid helium is you make yourself a torsional oscillator. It's, it's like a pendulum except it twists. So there's a restoring force to twist, a moment of inertia, a bunch of, of mass stacked in this case into plates, and as always the frequency is just the, the stiffness divided by the torsional oscillator. A moment of inertia, square root, what happens when you immerse the disks in a liquid, say liquid helium, you'd expect that all that really happens is, is if you move them back and forth, the moment, uh, the moment of inertia of the helium, the liquid, gets dragged along and adds to it. You get a larger moment of inertia, and you'd expect to get a reduction in the, in the frequency. That's what does happen if you're at high temperatures. But what happens in liquid helium is if you go below a temperature around 2 Kelvin, the frequency starts to increase as if some of the liquid helium is no longer moving with the motion of the oscillator, which is a characteristic of a superfluid. And so you say that the frequency is the stiffness times the 
total moment of inertia, the, the mass of the plates plus the helium, but minus something which is the superfluid that doesn't move. And so this gives you a measurement. The increase in frequency is a measurement of what fraction of it is superfluid. So this is well established in liquid, and you have a two fluid model that says there's a, a liquid is just a combination that depends on temperature. So the experiments in 2004 where you do the same thing, except instead of putting plates in a liquid, you, you make a container at high pressure and you put liquid in through this tors or torsion rod, pressurize it, and freeze the whole thing. So you have a crystal of helium in the torsion rod and also in the, in the rod here, but also in here. And you say, OK, well, a solid. It's going to move with it. So the moment of inertia is just the, the he all of the helium's moment of inertia. Uh, however, the measurements done by, by Kim and Chan at Penn State in 2004 showed something that looks a lot like this. As you go to lower temperature, or somewhere around 150 millikelvin, the frequency starts to increase, just as if some mass is decoupling. And so this was the long sought after, because it was predicted in 1969 or 70, a super solid. And this is about a, five, a few percent of the mass seems to decouple. The evidence, though, is just that it has a higher frequency at low temperatures. The other thing they noticed is if you oscillate it harder and harder, faster and faster, that effect goes away. But that's what you'd expect for a superfluid, because there's a critical velocity that a superfluid doesn't stay superfluid if you try to move it too fast. So this was the two pieces of evidence, the decoupling at low temperature and the apparent critical velocity. And so it was referred to as super solid, or if you're being conservative, non-classical rotational inertia was the, the term in, in favor. So this was 2004, and then that got half the people who were experimentalists in low temperature helium physics, turning and building torsional oscillators and trying to study solid helium. It was very quick. However, <coughs> we didn't build any torsional oscillators. Uh, instead, we did what we're more used to in my lab, which is measure the shear modulus, measure the elastic stiffness of the crystal. Just thinking it'd be useful to have that information. So the, the, schematically, the idea is you, you grow helium always inside a pressure cell, so you don't get to see it usually, at least not in my lab. And you grow, you put in this cell, you put two piezoelectrics that shear, that distort parallel to their surface if you apply a voltage. So this one, there's helium everywhere, including between the two of them. So I apply a voltage to this one, and it moves back and forth, shear. That distorts, shears the helium in the gap, and the, the, the shear exerts a force, a stress on the other surface. That, a piezoelectric works both ways. You put a voltage, it moves. If you put a stress, it generates a charge. And so it's very simple. You apply a voltage to this one. You can move it. You measure the current on this. That measures the, the, the force or the stress. And as always, the ratio of the stress to the strain is just by definition the shear modulus of the helium. So we just measured that. It was very, it's a very simple experiment. And this is what we saw. This up here is that torsional oscillator frequency written here as a percentage that's super solid, up to 1.5%. So that's just the data from the very first 2004 experiment. This is what we measured in a completely different property that has apparently nothing to do with super solidity. This is the shear modulus, and they look a lot alike, the temperature dependence. What's the NCRI? They, it's what they called non-classical rotational inertia. So if you want to get into an argument whether it's rather, really super solid or not, you can still say, oh, no, it's still this. So that was kind of, I think, Tony Leggett maybe the person who first called it that. I can't remember. But anyway, it's, they, they, they also equally well call it super solid fraction. However, the, the similarity between those is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. It either means there's something really interesting that shows up in two things, or else it means that, uh-oh, you know, you're measuring the shear modulus, and somehow it looks like a super solid. So they look a lot alike. If you shift them, that's how much alike they look, which is a little disconcerting, or for me, anyway. So <clears throat> the, one of the questions this raises is, how do these elastic changes, which are real, affect a torsional oscillator? And here's the problem. Here's the experiment with solid helium. Here's the interpretation that this is due to a decrease in the total inertia, makes the frequency go up. But what you're not paying attention to is up here. This is solid, not liquid. And so solid has its own shear modulus and stiffens the torsion rod. So if you stiffen the torsion rod, that also makes the frequency go up. And we just saw that this change in the helium's stiffness looks just like that. So that was the, the really big if. And I, I would say, that during our visit, my visit here in 2012 it was great. We, we, Sebastian and I looked at it very carefully. We emailed most of the groups and said, tell us more about the design of your torsional oscillator. We, you can calculate very simply how much stiffening it is, and you plug it in, and the problem is that virtually every torsional oscillator experiment, and there's about 10 groups doing it, 
it explained it. It was sufficient to explain, uh-oh, it's just a stiffening effect. And so I would say that that was essentially the death of torsional oscillator superfluidity, super solidity. The, and it, it, it stood up because there's no evidence left that people will say, everybody that believed that they had a super solid fraction and was skeptical of our argument went back, built a better torsional oscillator where there wasn't, it wasn't sensitive to elastic effects, and the effect went away. So the current state is there's no torsional oscillator evidence to suggest there's a super solid. It's all gone it's from about 2013. <clears throat> so <laughs> what I'm going to focus now back on what really is true, which is real, uh, which is this shear modulus anomaly. This is very unusual behavior, right? So here's one thing that is suspicious if you think it's a, if it, you think it's a super solid, which is that annealing the crystal kind of makes the effect kind of go away, which suggests it's something to do with defects. And the other thing that you should notice from this, this is the, the before and after. The black is the shear modulus as a function of temperature. When you first grew a crystal, then you anneal it and measure it. What you find is that zero temperature, low temperature, it's in its intrinsic state. It doesn't make any difference. It's in its intrinsic stiff real state. It's not actually stiffening, it's softening. This is the perfect crystal, and as you warm it gets softer, and how much softer it gets is, is not as much once you've annealed it. So you have to turn around and think this is a softening effect due to something at higher temperature, not a stiffening at low temperature. And it does depend on how you treat the crystal. It also, and we knew this right away, is if you do this measurement and you do it at higher amplitude, it also goes away. It becomes soft at all temperatures if you do it at high amplitude, right? And, and not very high amplitude. The, the stresses required to suppress this are very small. These, this has to be a very gentle experiment to see the effect. Okay, so this also, even though it's a shear modulus effect, is gonna make it look like a critical velocity. And finally, this, the temperature this happens is very, very sensitive to the, a tiny amount of helium-3 impurity, which wasn't expected, but when we checked it for good luck, it turned out to be. So regular helium that you buy from the supplier has maybe 100 parts per billion, 10 to the minus seven concentration of helium-3. You cool it down, there's nothing but helium-3, everything else freezes out. But going from 300, a couple hundred parts per billion of helium-3 down to high, pure, high isotopic purity, one part per billion, which is just getting rid of the last tiny little bit, it actually changes everything, all the temperatures by a factor of two. So it's incredibly, and that's not it. If, if I got rid of that one part per, B, per billion, it would keep going down. So even a part per billion is affecting the behavior of this, of, of this isotopic impurity that's chemically identical to the host. What, what was the vertical axis in the curve? All of these, in all of these, the vertical axis is a shear modulus. And this happens to be in a logarithmic plot, which is why it looks a little differently. So roughly speaking, how, how many <coughs> atoms does this represent in, 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 the, in the sample we have? At the, the, how many helium-3 atoms? Or? How many atoms? Because yeah, it's three. Oh, it's a, it's a cubic centimeter-ish, a few cubic, maybe a few cubic centimeters of, 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 yeah, so that's 10 to the 22 atoms, 10 to the 23 atoms total. And so 10 to the minus nine is still 10 to the 13th atoms. It's still a lot of atoms, but it's not a lot of percentage. <laughs> and we'll, I'll, I'll show you, we, we do better. In fact, in Sebastian's lab, we get rid of all our helium-3, <laughs> I believe. So it's a very, but it's still, it's a high, high sensitivity. And considering these are not chemically different, they're just the same atom, just a different isotope. And there are no other impurities. Okay, so metallurgists seeing this collection, they're gonna immediately say, it's a shear modulus, this has something to do with dislocations, because that's what affects elastic properties. And so just basics about dislocations, all of them have, any crystal has them. Maybe they only have one if you're really lucky. In growth, they often, screw dislocations help you grow, they give spirals. More often, if you indent something, you get a whole tangle of dislocation lines, they're lines, uh, kind of random. These are imaged in a transmission electron microscope. You can't do that in helium, but you can put them in a synchrotron and do an X-ray image. And you can't actually resolve individual dislocations, but you can tell there are areas where there's lots of them. So there are dislocations in, in single crystals of helium as well as in everything else. So what are they? Well, they're screw and edge, there's two kinds. This one's easier to describe, and it's the one we think is important. So if you imagine you take a perfect crystal, you cut halfway through it and slip a half plane of atoms into it from the top, this pink ones, the edge of this is a line going into the board and that's your edge dislocation. It's a defect around localized that there's lots of strain, far away the crystal is perfect, but you've inserted a half plane. And another thing that people know from metals is that if you anneal a crystal bit and look at them, they, they form a network. They, they're just not all random. Where they intersect, they're, they're very stable. You get a stable network. 
Uh, and you also know that if you put impurities or, or inclusions in, they tend to immobilize dislocations. They bind onto them, immobilize them, and quit, quit, they quit affecting the crystal. That's, for example, if you take copper, it's very soft, dislocations move. Uh, the more care you take in making copper, the softer it gets. But if you put half a percent or one percent of beryllium in it, it becomes hard like steel. Or if you want carbon steel, you put carbon in it to make it hard. It's because it immobilizes dislocations by binding and pinning. Um, However, they're not perfectly pinned. If I put a lot of stress on it, the dislocation is going to rip away from these pinning points and move freely if we put a lot of stress. And that's the origin of the amplitude dependence you often see in this kind of thing. And if you really, really deform it a lot, you're going to start to actually create whole bunches of new dislocations, tangles of them. And if you anneal them, you might get rid of some of them. So that explains why annealing is important. And the question then is how do they affect, quantitatively, how do they affect shear modulus? Well, here's a gra uh, my student simulation. So the, the, the little red thing that's moving represents a dislocation, the edge of this moving through a crystal. And if it goes through once, you'll notice that that rearranges and shifts half of the crystal above it, a complete lattice site one way or the other. So what happens is, is the dislocations move fairly easily because they're local deformations. But when they move right through, they cause a strain, an actual shear strain. And if you have a same force on them and more strain, that corresponds to a smaller shear modulus, basically. So they soften a shear modulus of the crystal by, by move, if they can move through it. Uh, how much? Just very hand waving. There's a network, and so they can't really move where they're pinned by where they meet other dislocations. But in between, if you exert a stress, they want to bow out and move. They move some distance. The, longer the separation between pinning points, network pinning points is, the further it moves. So the area swept out here, because this area in here, that's the part of the crystal that's slipped by one atomic space. And that area is proportional to the square of the length and proportional to the, to the stress. So if you multiply how far out it moves by the, on the average and multiply that by lambda, which is the total length of dislocations in the crystal, the density, that gives you how much strain you've got. It's proportional to the density of the, num the, the number of dislocations per square centimeter times the average length of the dislocations. And so the shear modulus, if, 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 the, if it slips by this much, the shear modulus is proportionally reduced. And it turns out that can be huge. <laughs> it, it's, it, it can be uh, 10, 20, 30 percent, much, much more than is ever seen in a metal, but it, it's possible. And the reason is because they do make a network and they pin each other. And if you have a high, high density of dislocations, that doesn't mean necessarily they have more effect because they also pin each other more. They intersect more often, they're shorter. And it turns out if you take something really simple like a cubic lattice just to see what the effect is, there's a, a network length between pinning points and a total length of all these lines. And this combination, the one that tells you how much the shear modulus drops, is actually just three. It's just a number for a cubic lattice. So you can imagine easily or can, can calculate easily that you could get as much as 30% drop in the shear modulus from this. Now this assumes that the in between here, the dislocations are free to move, and that's not always true. So if you have impurities, in this case helium-3, they're, they're attracted to dislocations elastically, always. And when they're attracted there, they bind onto them, and when they bind onto them, they don't move very easily through the lattice. They put a drag on it or they pin it. And so if you get lots of dislocations on the lattice, then what happens is the practical pinning length becomes much shorter than the, the, the one you thought you had. And the shorter it is, of course, the, more, the smaller this effect is. And if you really, really put a lot of impurities that can't move at all, then you go right back to the, the intrinsic modulus of helium. It's not softened at all. And so this explains, in a sense, both the, the temperature dependence and the helium-3 dependence, because they're bound on. They have a binding energy. And so the separation between them is just e to the minus the binding energy over the temperature. And so if you think of this as a constant helium-3 concentration in the solid, and you go, if you're at very low temperature, they all bound onto it. It's completely immobilized. As you warm up, from this, this changes just in equilibrium. And so the density of points becomes smaller, the length becomes smaller, and they start to move. And so as you warm up, they unbind, and it becomes free to move again. It softens the crystal. If you think about stop, go, just, just go to low temperature now, and say, what happens if I change the helium-3 concentration at some fixed temperature? Well, if you've got lots of helium-3 present in general, it'll be pinned. But at the same temperature, if you're really, really low concentrations, they're hardly going to be pinned. So as you go to lower helium-3 concentrations, 
it becomes free to move and soft again. So that shifts everything down to lower temperature, which is the effect we saw with the helium-3. So the, the helium-3 impurities are associated with that. We know that because we change it and it changes. And this is, this is a perfectly reasonable way to look at it. But it doesn't take very much. I mean, to your point, 10 to the minus 9 is plenty of helium-3 to pin all the dislocations if it all goes there, even less. 10 to the minus 10, 11 probably is enough to pin them, uh, which is very hard to get rid of. <clears throat> okay, so this is the summary of how dislocations are expected to affect and do affect uh, the shear modulus. If you've got a mobile dislocation network, you're going to soften your crystal to shear modulus. And it can, we, what we saw in our crystals, which are, by the way, polycrystals, just kind of the way we grew them, was about a 10% one, and that's within the range you expect. Helium-3 impurities, even small numbers, bind with a binding energy of about 0.7 Kelvin. We measured it, and then they pin them. And that means that when they go to low temperature, it's completely pinned. You go right back to the same elastic modulus you'd measure in a perfect crystal. Uh, as you in, put large stresses on them, helium-3 are not a very strong pinning point. It's not hard to rip the dislocations away from them. So the stress exerts a force, they rip away, and that explains the amplitude dependence. It's always soft at high amplitude. And as you go up in temperature, they just leave. They boil off the dislocation and become soft again. So this is a point before I took a sabbatical here, which was you know, largely we, we have a fair understanding of this, but it's not really the detailed, clear, you know, know everything about them. So the beauty of oh, I'm just it, the answer is really if you can go to single crystals and measure everything in a single crystal and control everything, you learn a lot more. But I couldn't do that. I couldn't see them. I had never seen a helium crystal I'd grown in my life before. But that was exactly what Sebastien's lab was doing here, growing helium crystals in an optical cryostat where you could do it. So I kind of brought the piezoelectric technique, and he had the optical and low temperature technique, and we, we, I spent a great eight months here. And so I'll quickly go through this, but this stuff was all done here. Everybody on these papers that sort of reflect most of the work is from LPS, ENS, except me, <laughs> and I was a visitor. <laughs> so in Sebastien's lab, you could see a, a cell. This is the cell, and it's got optical windows. The two transducers, you probably can't see, there's a tiny, tiny gap between them and a, a, whole, you know, a surrounding area. So you can see it a bit better when you project through. There's these two things here. The transducers are here, and the white part is a little narrow gap of a fraction of a millimeter where we grew the helium crystal. Helium crystals everywhere. But the beauty of this is you can grow single crystals from the superfluid at very low temperatures. So they're beautiful single crystals. Here you see one starting, if you, if you can see it from, from that distance. It's a very nice hexagon. You can tell right away, you know, helium's a hexagonal crystal. You can also tell the orientation. And as, we, as it was grown, the crystal's at the bottom, and as it starts to grow up through the gap, this measured shear modulus goes up and up, and so it's halfway up, it's two thir three quarters of the way up. And once it exits the helium, solid helium is above it, then it just stays the same. So this is the shear modulus, the difference is the shear modulus of the solid in the gap. But the beauty of this is that you, know, you can grow different crystals and they have different orientations. So you, with a little bit of effort, or a lot of effort actually, the, the graduate student grew a lot of crystals, you can see some examples. They're all hexagonal. Here's one that's sort of at 45 degrees, vertical is the gap. Here's one at some other angle. Here's one that's sort of lying horizontal at zero degrees with, with respect to the hexagonal C-axis. So you've got a coordinate system. And if you know all this, now you can transform your experiment into your frame of reference if you want, right? Transform your crystal. And it's just algebra. It's the usual thing. You know, you've got an elastic constant matrix with five separate elastic constants for a hexagonal crystal. You know the angle. You do a bunch of, multiply a bunch of tensors. And you can write an expression, which you won't possibly read, but doesn't matter. Uh, that expresses the measured shear modulus in terms of these angles of the crystal and the five different elastic constants that this crystal must have. And so if you do this and grow a bunch of crystals, here's the shear modulus. These are all different crystals. And you see something quite interesting. They're not all the same. They're all single crystals grown in the same way, just different orientations. Some of them are very stiff. One of them is very stiff. And it, not only is it very stiff, it doesn't soften at high temperature at all. Others soften a little bit. Others soften a lot, you know, soften 60%. They have less than half the shear modulus at high temperatures. These are all ones that you know the angles for. And actually, somebody has measured the elastic, five elastic constants, not their temperature dependence. And if you plug those in with these angles, they, they, they agree for every crystal. The, the zero temperature value is just the, the, the perfect crystal. 
And for example, if you take the one that's stiffest and never softens, that's the one at almost exactly 45 degrees. If you take the one that softens the most, that's the one that's almost horizontal at zero degree, 80, 90 degrees, I guess, the way the coordinates are. And the interesting thing about that is, again, you probably won't be able to tell, is this big, messy expression. This orientation is the one orientation that the measured shear modulus does not depend on, on C44, the, the shear modulus in the basal plane. And this one, where you get a huge softening, it's all C44 and very little else. So what this tells you is, is you're essentially measuring in a direction where you aren't sensitive to C44 and one where you are. And the only thing that's changing out of those five is the C44. One elastic constant out of all five is changing. The rest are doing nothing. So it's all in that particular plane. That's the plane where if you have a C-axis, you have all these planes stacked with your C-axis this way. If you slide it this way, that's the, the direction things can slide easily, C44. And so this change is huge, as much as 70% or another experiment, maybe 90%. You lose most of your shear modulus, which is sort of unheard of in regular materials. So that was, we referred to that as giant plasticity because it's dislocations moving and softening it. <clears throat> and then there's the obvious question, what happens if you don't pin them. Well, it, you know, it'll, it'll be soft, uh, but you know, does it, can it still move perfectly freely? These are some crystals that have a little bit of helium-3. This is increasing stress. This is shear modulus. This is increasing stress. And what happens with most of them, at some point, you've got enough stress that it breaks away. If you rip the, the dislocations away from the helium-3, and they soften. But here's one that was grown at low temperature from high isotopic purity, helium, and you know, I won't explain in detail, there's probably no helium-3 atoms in that. I mean, you, you could calculate it and it'll say none, zero. Not, not one, not two, but zero, I think. Um, and what you see then is it's soft all the time, this is at 20 millikelvin, all the way down to the very lowest place we could make the measurement, lowest stress, the most gentle way we could do it, the smallest force, it still moves freely. The dislocation still moves perfectly freely at the smallest stresses we could apply. If you took these numbers, this is a, a strain, a relative, distortion of 10 to the minus 11, which is about as gentle as you can do it. So, so I tried to work this out. If you take France, right, north to south, about 1,000 kilometers, and if you were to shift whichever border you prefer, to the left or right, whichever your preference is, um, by 10 microns, less than the width of a human hair, that, that's the strain that we're exerting on the helium crystal. It's, it's gentle. <clears throat> and so they appear to move dislocations freely with essentially no force on them. OK, so giant plasticity, a, a nice diagram to show this. This is a particular crystal. This is temperature. Between about 100 and 400 millikelvin, they seem to move completely freely, very soft. If you go to low enough temperature, whatever helium's left will bind them and stiffen them. Also, if you go to higher temperature, they seem to slow down the dislocations. It's because they, as they're moving, they're moving through all the thermal phonons, which scatter off and damp them. So, so at high temperature, there's an intrinsic damping. At low temperature, if, if you have any helium-3, there's a little bit of not intrinsic, but helium-3 pinning. <clears throat> so you know, this is what I showed you before, the change in the shear modulus. You, there's a slight correction. But basically, it's proportional to this combination of the density of dislocations times the square of their length. And that, it turns out, is not 3, which is what it would be for a, a, a cubic lattice, but it's 50, much, much larger. The effect of the dislocations and softening is much larger than if these things just randomly ran into each other. They must somehow align themselves to avoid that. So that's the first, only lesson you can really take from this, because you can't tell how dense they are or how long they are. You can just tell that combination. But they certainly aren't aligned in a cubic lattice or, or a random sort of orientation. They're sort of coordinated a bit to avoid that. But what you'd really like to know is these two things separately. And there is a trick to doing that, which worked really well, which was this is the shear modulus. But there's also a dissipation associated with the motion of the dislocations. And that, you can see, if you, you want to get rid of the helium-3 effect. So if you go to a little bit higher strain, this, this is the stiffening here, or softening with helium-3, if you just go to a bit higher amplitude, you pull them away and they don't really affect it. So other than this last little bit down here, the red curve is just the same crystal, but just measured at a higher damping, or higher, higher amplitude, so that you don't worry about helium-3 impurities. So this is the shear modulus. That gives you this combination. But if you measure the dissipation, the 1 over Q, 
It's proportional to that, but it also has proportional to frequency. It's proportional to whatever this damping term is that phonons or whatever give to it. And the same thing, there's a peak here. If you go low amplitude, that's the helium-3 unbinding. But if you suppress that by going to higher amplitude, between about 200 millikelvin and above, you're just seeing intrinsic behavior of the crystal now, which should be due to whatever causes damping. And people long ago calculated that. They said the most important term in damping a moving dislocation, as long as you're not a metal, if it's a metal, it's electrons. But if you're in an insulator like helium, it would be phonons, thermal phonons. The number of thermal phonons kind of goes like T cubed, the heat capacity of an insulator. And they calculated the prefactor, and they predicted a damping that would be there if there's nothing else. And so this plot is the, this, this dissipation, but measured in four different crystals of different quality. And in each crystal at several frequencies. This shows two different frequencies for each of these four crystals. And what's plotted here is the frequency times T cubed. So if, if this model is correct, it's proportional to the frequency and proportional to T cubed. And in every case, it's a beautiful straight line. It is proportional to T cubed. It is proportional to frequency. It's the phonon damping. And now that you know this, you can turn around and calculate how long those dislocations must have been. And the answer is they were. Uh, their length between pinning points was probably a couple, up, as much as a couple hundred microns, almost enough to see, if you could see them. Uh, and that means they, they move a long distance when you put a stress. They, they move at speeds up to centimeters per second without much problem at all, because they're free to move. There's nothing at low temperature to stop them from moving. Once that damping goes away at low temperature, they just move like, like anything. OK, so this was my background and up to roughly the point of a year or two after I left here when we got all this stuff written up. And so the last thing or two things that I'd like to talk about um, are plastic deformation, which is an extension of this to, to much larger stresses and much more dramatic motions in solid helium. And if there's time at the end, just at least briefly describe some experiments that uh, try to measure flow through solid helium. Because that's the one remaining hope if you're a true believer in supersolid, that there's evidence of some kind of flow at low temperature, and maybe it's some other kind of supersolid. But, but first, I'll do the plastic deformation that we've been doing recently. So a quick summary or quick primer on plastic deformation. The, the standard thing you measure in metallurgy is stress strain. You, uh, you strain something, you deform it, and you measure the stress. The slope of this from zero stress to here, this is linear. That linear one is just says that stress is proportional to strain. That just says this is the elastic regime. The slope of that is the elastic constant. But at some point you know, maybe here, it starts to deviate. And that's the point where it starts to plastically flow. It, plastic deformation set, onsets at some yield strength. Uh, that usually happens in a metal at, at a strain of a few tenths of a percent or something like that, or half a percent. That's where you really start to see it become non-elastic. Um, if you continue, it, it start, deforms more and more and the stress doesn't increase. It just continues to deform. This, and then at some point, it'll break. right? If you stretch a piece of metal, it'll stretch, stretch more easily, and then break. And that's the point at which it breaks. This is more likely several percent, or 10 percent, or even 100 percent deformation, depending on the metal before it breaks. Um, there's, there's other ways this can look, this stress strain. So for example, if you, if you try to deform a glass by stretching it, good luck. It's elastic. You can stretch it. It'll have a, an elastic constant. But before it really starts to plastically form, it'll just break. So there are things that elastically form break, brittle failure in something. Um, the opposite, where they, they deform easily in flow, is referred to as ductile. <clears throat> but in ductile flow, you might have a linear region, elastic region, a point at which it starts to yield. In, in some materials, particularly single crystals, once it starts to yield, it becomes easier. The, the, the stress actually drops. This is known as the yield point. The drop is the yield drop. Because what happens is you start to multiply dislocations. And once there's more dislocations, there's more deformations, it's easier. Sooner or later, though, you keep creating dislocations. They start to run into each other, tangle up, pin each other. In that case, something becomes harder. It's called work hardening or, or strain hardening. And then it, it becomes stiffer and stiffer. And then at some point, it'll break. And if you've ever, I don't know, taken a, a, a bar of metal or a piece of metal that's fairly pure or nice, it's not hard to bend. It's very hard to bend it back. If you, if you bend aluminum and bend it back, it's going to stay bent in the, in the region originally bent and bend somewhere else because it's, it's strain hardened in the region of bending, and now it has to bend somewhere else. This is a, just an example for copper from not too long ago, 10 years ago. Uh, this kind of curve 
depends on the rate. So it's not surprising that if you deform something slowly and then you deform it fast, it takes a bit more effort to deform it at a high rate. These curves are copper. Uh, this is a, deforming it a million times faster than this. So it's not a huge effect, but it does depend on rate. That's normal for, because something has to happen. There has to be some thermal motion and stuff. So if you do it really fast, there's not time, and it's a bit harder to bend, harder to bend or stretch. It also depends strongly on temperature. And so this is copper at room temperature, roughly, which is this top curve. If you do the same thing, same rate, um, which is to deform this one in a millisecond or something quite quickly, you find that the hotter it is, by the time you get up to near its melting, it it's much more, moves much more easily. Everybody knows that you don't trust metals at high temperature because they start to plastically deform too easily. So those are the characteristics of, oh, and one other thing that people usually associate with plastic deformation is you, elastic region, what if you stop before it breaks and then just release the stress, right? It doesn't go back where it started. You've irreversibly deformed it. When you release the stress, it's, it's got some strain, it's deformed. That's also typical of, of plasticity. Okay, so helium. There were some old experiments. People thought about this a long time ago. So some of them are quite neat, but kind of brute force. So this is one done in Japan where somebody took a, a ball, a metal ball, welded a wire onto it, ran the wire up to room temperature, hung it in a cryostat, grew solid helium all around the ball, and then just pulled the ball through it to see how hard it was to pull through it, because you're deforming the solid helium then. It's kind of crude, uh, but they did it. And what they found here on the, the stress-strain curve, stress versus strain, is yes, there's an elastic region, but at some point there is a yield, and they saw yield drop. In other words, as soon as it started to yield, it became easy to, to deform it. So they saw what they thought was clear evidence of, of a yield drop. But this is at fairly high temperature. This is above half the melting temperature. Um, and another experiment done shortly after, you, you can't possibly, they, they, were, they put a lot of effort in. This is one, instead of pulling a ball through it, which really is hard to do <laughs> care for, accurately, um, they, they built a cell with bellows and they, they put a piston in it and then they applied gas pressure and pushed the piston down. So they deformed it in a bit more controlled way. And what they found, they didn't see any yield drop. They saw a curve, a stress strain curve, where, where it started to flow, and then they stopped and it went back, but it didn't go back to where it started. So they saw you know, a classic kind of stress strain flow curve, but then they did something which I wouldn't have thought would work, is they put a heater on the outside and they, they, they managed to melt on the, on the outside of this cylinder a, a layer, it became super fluid, so there's nothing constraining it at the outside. What they found then is they couldn't even measure, it was too easy. They couldn't measure the force required to deform it when it was not constrained. But, they, but it, again, it wasn't that sensitive a measurement. Um, so it creeps is what you would call this. This you'd call a yield, with yield drop, this you'd call a creep at high temperature, both high temperature experiments. So what we did was we tried to get away from this limitation of only high temperature measurements and, and do them with more sensitivity. I'd like to, this part here that I showed you before where if you do it if you put a fairly large stress in this sense, it move, breaks away from helium-3. That's not the regime. That's a pinpoint down here. These stresses and strains are kind of a million or a hundred million times smaller than you normally see plastic deformation. These are really not what we would call plastic deformation in that irreversible sense. They're, they're incredibly small. So this linear regime, this is all part of it. So we have to go to much larger stresses and strains to try to really honestly deform, plastically deform these helium crystals. 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th times larger is kind of what we need. So we wanted to study this regime. We wanted to study also at low temperature. So all we did is we took our same experiment. Again, a little hard to see. This is just what you'd see if you could see inside the cell when it's open. There's the two transducers, but one of the transducers, the one that drives it, that creates the displacement, has been replaced by a whole stack of 20 transducers. So you get 20 times as much displacement. You just get bigger displacement. But the other thing is those measurements that I talked about, how gentle they were, they were done by applying a millivolt or something to the transducer. We, we apply 400 volts. And so by doing that combination, we're able to deform not by 10 to the minus 11, but by almost a fraction of a percent. So we did that. And again, it's just the, 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 the strain is just by putting a voltage on it, you just ramp the voltage, you ramp the strain. It's a constant strain rate experiment. And over here, you measure the stress and you, you, know, you, you measure the current and integrate it to get the stress. So you just measure a stress strain curve during a, a linear ramp, a, a constant strain velocity experiment. Perfect version of metallurgy, only a lot simpler to do and sensitive. So the first thing I noticed is this is just a loop where we 
we apply a voltage and increase the strain, then we turn around and decrease it negative, and they come back where we start. And so the dashed line, this is data actually, I mean you can't just tell it, but the dashed line I'll start with, you start here at zero, as we increase it, it deviates and starts to creep and flow. At this point we stop and it goes back. So when we get back to zero stress, there's still a really big displacement. It, it is irreversible. We keep going and we get this big open loop. We, we end here and start here. So it certainly is not reversible. If we go down, that was done at 900 millikelvin, sort of 60% of the melting temperature, high temperature experiment. Instead of that, if we start there at 25 millikelvin, it's almost linear, it's pretty much linear back and forth and it ends exactly where it starts. It's pretty much elastic behavior. There's a little loop, but I think that has more to do with the transducers than the helium. Okay, so there is a difference with temperature, clearly. So the first thing I'll just show you the high temperature behavior, just show you how soft helium actually can be. So this is the measured current, forget that, but if you integrate this, you get this, the, on this axis the, the stress, and this is the strain up to about 0.4%. And if you do it fast, it takes a little more stress to move it. If you do it slow, it's a little easier. These, these, uh, the scale here is that this is about four kilopascals, a fraction of a, of a bar, uh, a fairly small fraction of a bar. So this is pretty, pretty soft. If you go, this one melted about 1.5 Kelvin. If you go up to 1.2 Kelvin, everything's even faster. Same, same crystal, just higher temperature. And what you see now is it's, it's even easier. Again, the fast one's a little harder to move, but as soon as you exceed about it's about 10 times easier. The stress is here about 10 times smaller. And if I went closer to melting, there'd be another factor of 10 or 100 times. What that means is this helium, even though it's a, a crystal, it's a crystalline material, it's, it's flowing at stresses that are really small. Um, I mean, certainly it would flow at a few pascals if we took it close to melting. It would flow uniformly and continuously forever. So that was kind of interesting to see just how soft it is, because people historically, when they try to tell you how soft helium is, they, they say it's, eh, it's about like butter, you know, your butter. They don't tell you what temperature the butter's at. But um, in, in labs, though, people who think of a soft metal that flows, they think of indium as one of the softer metals. Indium, if you take a wire of it, you can pin, cut it off with your fingers. It's not a problem, it's soft. Indium's kind of, Tensile strength at room temperature is measured in megapascals. It's a few megapascals. As I said, this could be a few pascals. So it, it, it really is, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 times more ductile or softer than indium when you get up anywhere near melting. So if, if, if you had a little cube of helium, if you didn't have to keep it in a pressure cell and keep it pressurized and hold it in place, if you were able to take that and set it, it would just under its own weight just turn into a puddle quite quickly because it's got very, very easy flow when you're anywhere near melting. Okay, so the most interesting thing though is when we tried to answer the question at low temperature, does it behave that way or is it brittle? And, and we honestly didn't have a good guess, good bet. So what we did, this is the same kind of measurement. This is the stress versus strain, only this is at 16 millikelvin. And all that data I showed you before is flowing way, way down here. At this temperature, it stays linear and elastic to much, much higher stresses and strains. Um, the, the strain here is 15 kilopascals instead of a few pascals that you might expect. And this is the, the, the current we measure, this is the integrated to get this. And you'll see a little glitch there that something happened at about 0.3%. And if you blow that up, you see, okay, well there's a dip in the signal. That corresponds to a, a sudden, fairly sudden, drop in the stress. So you strain and strain and strain it, and then suddenly it relax, it, something jumps, it slips, and you, you, you reduce, re relax some of the strain that you built, stress that you built up. It this one on this diagram it corresponds to relaxing about 5% of the total stress. And it seems like it happens over about two seconds. But it's, it's actually faster than that because we have a preamp with a bandwidth of 0.3 hertz. So this is totally due to the bandwidth, the bandwidth of the preamp. So we of course want to do it faster. Um, so what we did is we did the same experiment. The, the upper one is, this is the ramp, this is the measured strain ramp as a function of time. This is the data that I showed you before. These are the glitches. And so this is a 0.3 hertz preamp, sample it a few times a second, very slow. The same kind of, a different, same crystal, different run. We did exactly the same thing. We, we deformed it over about 100 seconds. And we see things, but they seem much sharper. That's because we're now have switched to a, a 400 kilohertz preamp. So we can measure things up to a few microseconds or as short as a few microseconds. And we sampled at a couple megahertz so we could do this. So there's a lot of data in 120 seconds actually. 
Okay, so we did that. So if we take this biggest spike here, blow it up. So this is 100 seconds, 120 seconds. This is, I don't know, five milliseconds. Sorry, th th this whole decay. So what, something happens, and it's not a spike. There's something decaying over about 40 microseconds. Did I get that right? Sorry, 40 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds afterwards. And, but if I blow a few milliseconds up and blow it up again, what I see here, by the time I get to here, this whole time length here is, is, a, is a, what is it? I don't know, uh, 50 microseconds or something like that. The, the, there's a, an event, a, a drop, a sudden drop, which means this, a little bit of stress has been relaxed, there's been a little bit of slip, and it's followed by a bunch of oscillations that go on and die out slowly. Um, so it's about a 10 microsecond event followed by a long ringing. <clears throat> Uh, but unfortunately, that's not necessarily, that's now also the limit of our preamp is 10 microseconds, so it might be faster. <clears throat> uh, what's the 40 microseconds of ringing? Well, you can Fourier transform. It's very sharp at 10.5 megahertz, which is just, you've got inside the cell, you've got these two transducers, you're doing this, and suddenly something slips quickly. It's just like hitting it with a hammer. You set the entire cell full of helium into resonance, acoustic resonance, and you can calculate it, that's it. So all of this ringing is not the event, it's the, the, the ringing after you hit it hard with something sharp. So <clears throat> we'd still like to go faster because that, this is what we're interested in and we want to know how fast that is. So we finally put it on a fast digital scope and found that the actual event, forget the rings later, it happens in, you know, the, this time here is, is uh, I mean, like 40, 50, nanoseconds, sort of the, the period of this quick part. If you Fourier transform it, it, it's sort of around 20 megahertz, so 50 nanoseconds is the typical time. So this is a very fast event in helium that, that the crystal somewhere slips. And it can't slip over a big area because otherwise it would be smeared over a much longer time. Right? Deformation can't happen faster than the speed of sound in the crystal. And so if you get a sudden event and it moves and slips an area, that takes a time, the sound velocity times the distance in order to happen, and, and that's limited because it can't be more than 100 or maybe even 50 nanoseconds. That tells you that whatever you saw there, and this is really sound, so an event happened in a region that might be five or less or 10 or less microns, a very tiny region of your sample, and then it, it, it did it very fast and it emitted sound waves, which that's what you picked up, the acoustic emission. So that's the, the size of these very, very small, very, very fast, uh, slip events, which we, as in almost everything, they're due to dislocation, avalanches. They avalanche and eventually they pile up and stop themselves. That's what we expect is happening. And I just point out the analogy with earthquakes. So this is some old one picture in California of a field. You can see there's been a slip deep down, but you can see it at the surface, the slip of the, of the crystal or of the crop, I guess. Um, if, if you look at a seismogram, this is actually a big earthquake. This is a Chilean one in 2010. And this, this, this time period is a few hours. And what you find is once the seismic waves arrive at the other side of the world in this case, then there's a whole bunch of them and they spread out over an hour. They kind of have characteristic frequencies of a few seconds to a minute, the actual waves, and they last for a while. So this is the equivalent of our acoustic emission. So you have a slip event, acoustic emission. But then the same big earthquake, if you get a big earthquake, just like if we have a big slip, you can sit and wait, and you find that the entire Earth goes into resonance. The lowest frequency resonance of the Earth is it takes about an hour, and there's a whole higher frequency modes. And so they measure the whole spectrum of the Earth, and these are those acoustic resonance of the whole thing that we saw. So, so this is basically the path to slip, the acoustic emission, and then the not so interesting resonance of the whole thing. So um, the difference being that our little helium quakes are a lot faster, uh, of order 100 nanoseconds versus the minutes it took for that Chilean earthquake. It's, the Chilean earthquake slipped over about 600 kilometers over a minute or two. So ours are microns, theirs are hundreds of kilometers, et cetera, but, but the whole idea is pretty much the same. You put a, a larger and larger stress until at a weak point on the place it slips. And th this was, this, this paper on plastic deformation was published a few months ago. If you want more information, um, but it's interesting, even in a metal, you can get dislocation avalanches, you can deform. 
and you can do it incredibly rapidly. Like you can deform something explosively in a microsecond. You still can't make those dislocations move as fast as they move in helium because they're always damped by something. In helium at low temperature, there's nothing left to damp them. They just move as, at the speed of sound virtually, which is essentially impossible in conventional materials. Okay, so I'll just spend a few minutes, not many, um, talking about, well, could there still be a super solid? <laughs> Um, and for, to me, that's an open question, but I, I lean to no, but that's my opinion. So one of the first things in 2004 when the torsional oscillator measurement seemed to show a supersolid decoupling was, if it's a supersolid, it should flow. Why not just measure the flow? And that's partially my bias that I don't do super solid. Don't, I've never built a torsional oscillator, so I wasn't going to do that. So we did an experiment back in 2006. This is just the real cell. Schematically, the cell is you have the blue is solid helium. There's two chambers. There's a big chamber and a little chamber. The big chamber has a, a diaphragm that you can flex and you can push on it with a piezoelectric. So you can actually squeeze on this side. You can squeeze the helium in the big chamber by a micron and increase the pressure on that side. On the other side, you put a very, very sensitive pressure gauge, very low, you know, sensitive to pressure, which means that if the helium moves by an angstrom, you would detect it on that side is quite sensitive. In between, you put some little tiny holes to see if it flows through them between the two chambers. So the holes we chose to get lots of sensitivity are something called a glass capillary array. It's a piece of glass that had about 36,000 holes with a 25 micron diameter. The plate of glass is about three millimeters thick. So these are long, skinny channels, 25 micron diameter holes. So that's what's in between. So we push on this side, look on that side to see if anything comes through. And the answer was no, not down to the lowest temperatures we could reach. And if you say, OK, there is no flow, or at least we put an upper limit, what's the upper limit? Well, the answer is we would have seen flow, because we just wait for 24 hours, and it doesn't even move an angstrom. So that would be a, a limit on the flow of 10 to the minus 5 nanometers per second. It's, if, if it flow exists, that's actually about a million times slower than your hair grows, for context. It's not a super flow, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> uh, OK, so the question, though, I mean, I, I wouldn't have this part if that was the end of it. The answer is there's no flow under those conditions. So here was the phase diagram in 2004 proposed that there's a, a, a super solid below about 200 millikelvin and normal solid above. We, we would say, no, there's a stiff, elastically stiff state below there and a soft state above it. That's, that's what the, the view we would take. And our experiment that showed no flow said, that no, was no flow there. And we were by far, far from the only ones. Starting in 1977, people periodically tried to look for superflow. You know, all the way till a couple years ago, all these red ones are people who looked in different pressure and temperature regimes and never saw flow, super, not, not, never saw flow through the solid. Um, so that would be the end, except that in 2009, a different group, the University of Massachusetts group, did an experiment in a, in a range that overlapped other people's, and they did see some sort of flow. So the question really, I think, is what do you need to do to find flow in solid helium? Um, and so very quickly, there's two kinds of experiments. The Moses Chan's Penn State group with Ariel Azio, who was a graduate student here. As, he was there as a postdoc. They, they did a similar geometry. But the geometry here is you, have a, you grow somehow solid helium, and you, inject, you have two superfluid leads, which is a trick, because at those pressures, be, the helium in the leads would be solid, except that you confine it in micron or nanometer size channels of a glass, it stays superfluid. So these are actually superfluid leads. And the idea is you add pressure and try to inject solid into a solid and see if it comes out the other side. If it did, it must have flowed through it. That's, it's that simple. Uh, this is the same thing, except here's the two, po two porous vicor leads, and the solid's a little tiny thin piece in the middle. And so what you find is when you raise the pressure, this is in this experiment, you suddenly, the red one is you raise the pressure on one side. And then as you wait, it decays. But you measure the pressure on the other side, and you see it starts to rise. And you end up with them at the same pressure. Something must have flowed through that center region they believe is completely solid. And similarly here. And the other thing was noticed by the, the UMass group is if it was kind of sensitive to helium-3 impurities again. And so this is actually a plot where they found that this flow is not what you'd expect. You'd expect some kind of flow at high temperatures, like the creep we saw in crystals, but at low temperature it goes away. This is the opposite. This, this flow only appears around cool, only appears around 600 millikelvin. It gets faster and faster as you cool. Eventually, about around 100 millikelvin, it suddenly drops to zero. 
So it's increasing at low temperature. The drop here is related to how much helium-3 you have in the system. And this is too messy to see, but they did a whole bunch of, of different helium-3 concentrations in their gas. And the less helium-3, the lower you could go before this drop occurred. So, presume, so maybe if you eliminated the helium-3, you, you would keep, it would keep increasing to zero temperature. So there is a problem, right? And it, these two highlighted, which is you don't know if you have helium-3 in the solid. You only know you have helium-3 somewhere in the system. And thermodynamically, helium-3 atoms want to leave the solid and go to a lower energy dissolve in the liquid. So the risk is that you do all this and all that really happens is all the helium-3 goes into your superfluid leads and it's not in your solid anymore and you don't know that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I won't go through all that because uh, I'll just mention how we tried to eliminate those problems. We eliminate the effect of helium-3 and eliminate the problem of not knowing where it is and eliminate the superfluid lead. So we use the same system we used before to look for flow, only instead of that, all those 36,000 holes, we just put a channel about a couple millimeters in diameter, filled it with solid, and we squeezed on one end and waited to see if something came out the other. It's that simple. So we could do a DC experiment, or you could oscillate the pressure and see it's a little more sensitive to do it AC. And so we looked for flow. This is with helium-4. This is the kind of things we saw. This is DC, where you raise the pressure on one side. This is the pressure on the other side. This is the response. And then you take it all away, and it goes back. But this is kind of backwards to conventional things. This one where there's very little flow, the slope of this is how fast it's flowing, that's, that's the high temperature. That's 600 millikelvin. And as you get colder and colder and colder, the flow gets faster and faster and faster. So it's not thermal. It's, it's like the other group saw. It may be super flow. And so the, this is our version of their plot. It's, it's scattered because we didn't actually spend years and years perfecting it. We did it fairly quickly. But it does show the fact that helium-3 matters. There's some curves here with different ones. We did it with AC, which is just a lower noise way of doing this. So the black curve, where it just keeps going and going and going up and up and up, is actually one where there's almost no helium-3. This is kind of the world's purest helium-4, with only a few parts per trillion of helium-3. Thank you, Sebastian, for sending it to us. <laughs> um, so what we found is, yeah, in helium-4 solid, there is a flow. It starts at that temperature, gets larger, and just keeps getting larger at the lowest temperatures. But is it super flow? So the last slide I have with data is just, we just, just did the, the obvious experiment you can always do with helium, which is if you think it's super flow in a Bose condensed thing, just try it with helium-3, which isn't a boson and is not going to have super flow of that sort. So we grew helium-3 crystals. It's not going to be super fluid, but it is more quantum mechanical. There's even more zero point motion. There's even more uh, exchange, et cetera. So this is just the bottom line from, from a paper that actually probably should come out in the next week or so, um, which is the green is the helium. Ah, I, I label it backwards. Sorry. The green is the, the helium-4 data that I just showed you, increasing flow down to the lowest temperature. The, the black, which is mislabeled, is as we cooled it, there was some flow, it all went away, and there's nothing at low temperature. So there really is a difference between helium-3 and helium-4. If you're an optimist, you say, well, OK, there's some, the helium-4 solid is some sort of superflow. It, it's supportive of it anyway. Where in the solid is a, a mystery. The, the assumption is that it's in the groups that believe it, they, they believe it flows along superfluid cores of dislocations. They believe superfluid, dislocations cores are themselves superfluid, one-dimensional superfluid, and that it somehow flows. But they have no direct ev evidence from anything else about the dislocations. So I would say this is a completely open question, that one. So that's my summary. I'm sorry if I took a bit longer. Helium is really soft, like a lot softer than any other crystal that you're used to uh, at high temperature. It's soft, but it's, it, it's brittle at low temperature. It breaks like anything else, only, only faster, uh, faster than anything else. Helium-3 flows a little bit at low temperature, uh, uh, not the kind we saw, almost not at all. And helium flows a lot at low temperature, so there may be something there. So really, we know for sure that defects, dislocations especially, are incredibly mobile in quantum solids. They dominate essentially everything. And basically, that's the, the bottom line of the talk. So thank you. <laughs> For instance, um, are there more um, screw dislocations or PLC dislocations? Can you answer that kind of question? You know, you, you, we don't have an experimental answer. Of, of course, there are. Uh, so anything that we say we know about dislocations from elastic ones is we know about mobile dislocations that move in a particular direction. Yeah. 
Uh, they're probably edge dislocations. Th th that's one question too. I mean, uh, how, how do they move with respect to the edge um, axis, to the uh, hexagonal axis? They, they, they glide in the basal plane. Okay. We, that we know. Or, or I guess you can glide vertically, but we don't think that's happening. But they glide essentially in that direction. Screw dislocations, vertical ones gliding in that direction would also do it, but we, for various reasons, we, we think they're probably edge dislocations. They must be in one of two directions, almost certainly in the basal plane. Um, there are edge, there's no question there's screw dislocations. There's no question there's dislocations in other directions, but they don't seem to move because they don't soften the crystal. So there probably is a Purell's barrier for other dislocations. It's just the ones in the basal plane that are free to move. In the dislocation uh, avalanche process you mentioned, is there a possibility to create uh, grain boundaries? To create them or to be limited well, by I them? Well, to accumulate dislocation. You, you so, would. So that if, if you, yeah, I should have said that almost all the experiments we do, I mean, I do away from <laughs> ANS, are, are actually <laughs> in polycrystals. Um, so there are grain boundaries. There, most people believe that the main grain sizes, even in polycrystals, are millimeters, not microns. Uh, but there's probably low angle grain boundaries. So when dislocations avalanche and multiply, if they build up at a barrier like a grain boundary, they would stop. So they would. I think it's not, it's possible, but not too likely that the five or 10 micron size we see in those fastest events is a grain boundary size. That, there's no evidence for, for grains being that small, mm. I don't think. So they, they still must pile up somewhere. That, that distance is almost, it's roughly the separation between individual dislocations, that, that 10 micron size. So it's kind of a funny, arrange, you know, kind of a funny range. So, but they must, I, I think everybody thinks of a dislocation avalanche as starting, moving, multiplying, and eventually piling up somewhere and stopping. So something like that stops them because they don't propagate through the whole sample. Mm. Some of them don't, some do. <laughs> Where do you see uh, really the quantum effects? If I look at these avalanches, for instance, I mean, the signals look like in classical systems. Do you have a size distribution? We, we haven't done enough, exp I mean, we see different sizes of dislocations. We haven't done enough to get distribution. So, so you're right, I mean, this is an awful lot like the dislocation avalanches you see in, in metals sometimes, ice, actually. There's a lot of studies of dislocation avalanches in ice. Uh, I think probably, the place where the quantum nature of the dislocation comes in is the, is the, the sheer fastness of them. I mean, the fact that they can, the, 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 there really is nothing except the sound speed to stop them. Uh, most, most are, dis, uh, maybe if you study the dis distribution more, that would show up in something, like there's other processes for stopping them. But I, it's not unique to quantum solids that you have dislocation avalanches. They just happen to be, I don't know, I would say simpler in the sense that there's only one damping mechanism and we, by now we know an awful lot about which dislocations move, et cetera. So there's a lot more you could do. You could, you could look at distributions and try to see if it's a different distribution than, than in conventional materials. You certainly see avalanches in, and sudden slips in micro and nano pillars too. I mean, that's, that's a place where people are studying it actively. Uh, and there it's limited by the size of that thing. <clears throat> Um, if you allow me, I, I have a partial answer for Gérard and a mm -hmm. question for you. Go. So we, we, we know a little more about these dislocations which are moving and consequently reducing the, the one of the elastic uh, constants. Uh, the, the thing is that these dislocations are not really lines, in fact. They split mm -hmm. into uh, two partial dislocations with a so-called... Um, uh, uh, what is that Stacking called? fault between them. Stacking fault, sorry, thank you. In between, so they are ribbons, and uh, they, they move parallel to the, the, the hexagonal planes. Or well, that's what we yeah. believe. Now, a question for you. So because I remember discussing this problem of the flow, which you mentioned at the end of your talk. So uh, my memory is that it's far from obvious that the flow well, that is observed really takes place inside the bulk of the crystal. That would be the, the, the case if the flow is inside these dislocations I was talking ab about just before. But there is another possibility, which is that the flow takes place at the boundary between the solid and the wall around. For example, because there are corners, and the solid does not wet the wall. So the corner is still full of liquid. So 
if you imagine a path by the corners of the cell, well, it's not always possible. Mm -hmm. But then there is another possibility because these experiments are made with polycrystals, which is that any, uh, any grain boundary, when touching the wall, it makes again a, li a liquid channel because for reasons of, uh, of uh, surface tension balance, uh, the, the boundary arrives here and then opens into a, a, a sort of liquid region which, is, uh, which is, has a triangular uh, cross-section. You see exactly what I mean? Uh, the, and we see that, actually. It's observed. So where are we exactly in the discussion of the, the right place where this flow takes place? Yeah, so this was basically, I think, the, the most open question. There, there's flow of some sort, and various groups have seen it. But most of the people got interested because they wanted to realize a one-dimensional superfluid. It's a very interesting system. Um, we got into it later because we were kind of a little bit suspicious that this isn't quite what's going on. So the films part was exactly what Sebastian was referring to. It might be an li actual liquid film at the wall from not wetting, or, or it could be a grain boundary. And so we actually argued that I think that that's more likely, but it's very hard to, I mean, we don't get to look and see these things. The dislocations you can't see directly. We don't have an open cell. So the, the only tool we can think of to try to that is, is see how much helium-3 it takes to block it. Because the, the helium-3 that you put in is not a lot, but it's got to be blocking it somewhere. And the problem with the dislocation model is it just takes, you know, they have this picture, a, a helium-3 on a dislocation blocks the flow. Well, one helium-3 dislocation per, one helium-3 per dislocation is a concentration of like 10 to the minus 18 or something. It takes virtually no helium-3 to block one-dimensional channels. So I'm concerned about that. So we, if in more detail these papers we published, looked at, in our experiments, the amount of helium-3 that was required. And our conclusion was it's hard to understand unless it was a 2D channel, a film somewhere. It's hard, it took more helium-3. The, there's a neat place that the helium-3 may block all those other experiments with the superfluid leads, which is the favorite place for helium-3 ever is at the interface between liquid and solid helium-4. It's tightly bound there. So in principle, that's where it goes. And you, it, by some kind of a coincidence in the Vicor ex experiments with the superfluid leads, they always block right pretty much where there's one monolayer of helium-3 on that interface between liquid and solid. Helium-4 doesn't dissolve into helium-3, so that's a, either a coincidence or, or a clue, but with, in our experiments without the liquid, it took a lot more helium-3 to block the channels. So we're suspicious that it's in a, not in one-dimensional channels. The, the problem is that nobody who does the experiments and says their dislocations has ever seen a dislocation or has any other measurement that shows anything about dislocations in the same experiment. They, they hope, they guess, they assume but they don't have any measurement of dislocation. So I'm, I'm suspicious of the dislocation flow myself, but. Uh, getting back to the, the shear modulus that you have shown us in the first part mm -hmm. of your talk, I was wondering how much was plastic deformation in this shear modulus measurement and how much was elastic? I mean, it seems that it was mostly plastic or did I misunderstand? Okay, it? now, no, you, 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 we, could, we have gotten in arguments with referees. We, ca it was, we called it giant plasticity. There's, there's two kind of things that people often associate with plasticity. One is that it's a defect thing. It's not in a perfect crystal. Mm. It's the motion of, say, dislocations. That's certainly the case. Mm. The other is, oh, it's irreversible. It, it, you know, and that's not the case. The, the, this dislocations move and come back perfectly reversible if you don't move them too far. So at the strains that we're talking about, it, the softening is because of dislocation motion. Up to 90% of the deformation is from dislocations and 10% is elastic in, in the softest case. But we're still, as I said, like six or eight orders of magnitude away from it macroscopically deforms and dislocations multiply. So there, there is from the, I don't know, the 1960s and 70s, there, there's a book or two and there was an area where people thought about these things in metals and they chose to call that an elasticity. It's not perfect elasticity. They didn't like calling it pl plastic because it, didn't have some of the characteristics. So the problem is that, as far as I know, anybody I've ever said anelasticity doesn't know what I'm talking about. So, so, so it's not a very useful term to explain things. So it's, it's, but it's, it, there's two regimes, the real macroscopic plasticity, the giant plasticity is, is, is from defects, but it's in a reversible regime. So it's terminology okay. more than anything. Thank you. And everybody has an opinion on terminology. <laughs> <laughs> everybody in the field. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If you think of, um, of a 2D uh, motion uh, on the 
would processing the surface uh, change things? I mean, the, I mean the the surface uh, of the. Um, of the, of the walls. Uh, the of walls the walls, the yeah, I mean. People have tried, thought, so the problem is that solid helium doesn't seem to wet anything. So any, almost, sorry, with one exception, if you could make graphite basal plane walls, it would grow from them and you'd, you'd get rid of that issue. Uh, I mean, there are things that are not coincidences. This flow is only seen just when you're close to the melting curve. If you raise the pressure a bit above the melting curve significantly, the flow doesn't appear. So that's kind of the behavior if you have a liquid-like film or channel, when you pressurize it rapidly, it gets smaller until it becomes a monolayer and it's no longer a film of liquid. And so it's also evidence that somewhere the pressure is squeezing something. Dislocations are almost immune to pressure, right? So and this is indeed what they are observing. Mm -hmm. They see this flow, which you mentioned in the end of the talk. Only they are close to the melting curve. Yes. And this is what I remember uh, I know. taking yeah. as a proof that it's a, it's a surface phenomenon. Yeah. It occurs in the roughness of the wall or something like that, where the solid does not enter because it's not wetting. So yeah. it, 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 there remains uh, liquid helium channels, liquid helium channels at the interface between the, 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 the copper wall and the solid helium crystal, except if you raise the pressure up when you force the crystal to invade the roughness of the mm. wall, which is that atomic size is existing, and then it should disappear. But well, this is exactly what they observe. Yeah. The, the closest, the, the current effort that's trying to f really pin that down is this experiment at Penn State. There's a paper, has been under ref review for some time, I believe. But in this geometry, they, they tried, like, to do everything they could to show that it's not at the, at the boundaries, that it's, right, it's through this piece of solid. So they, in the middle of it, they put a block. They just put a piece of metal in the middle of it to see if it stopped the flow. And then they, they put, I can't remember what all they did. They put aerogel to pin things down, you know, like to prevent dislocations from moving. They, the, the, really, the thing they did, which may or may not mean anything, is they inserted little bits of graphite in here to try to force the crystal to grow this way and this way. They, they've no evidence, I mean, there's no direct evidence that it worked, but if it worked, they saw a difference between the C-axis this way and the C-axis in the flow direction. But I confess it's more like a hope than it is a, a proof. <laughs> but they're, they're working hard to try to pin that down. I can't think of a perfect way to do it except, who knows? We're all the bad guys. <laughs> because, uh, they dream about a one-dimensional superfluid flow, which is a Luttinger liquid and blah, blah, blah. And we come back and we say, well, there might be a defect on the surface, <laughs> which uh, has the same, uh, the same effect. And the dislocation stuff, it, it's not random. I mean, it was, those experiments originally in Penn State were motivated by the, the theoretical group there that is sort of state of the art path integral Monte Carlo first principles. And they said years before these measurements were done that certain dislocations, and they said which ones they are, are going to be superfluid in the core. So they, they had a reason to try this. But. <laughs> Okay, if there is no more question, we'll thank again John. Thank you. Thank you.